you. Anyway, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to hear a very old story. Maybe you read it in college or in high school or in university. Uh, it's from a man named O. Henry. It's not the O. Henry bar, uh, but his name is O. And then the last name is Henry. And uh, we have June uh, coming up this morning to read it for us. So make sure the mic is good and close, June. Hello? Is it on? The gift of the Magi. It doesn't sound like it's on. It's only up front here in the, in the monitors on the stage. Hello? Hello? One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. Three times Della counted it. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. Della finished her crying and wiped her cheeks with the powder rag. She had been saving every penny she could for months. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far. Many happy hours she had spent planning for something nice for her husband, Jim. Something fine and rare and sterling. Something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. Della stood before the mirror. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within 20 seconds. Quickly, she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. There were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs, in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Della's beautiful hair fell about her shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment on her. And then she did it up again nervously and quickly. Della put on her old coat and her old hat and she flew out the door and down the stairs to the street where she stopped at a sign that read, Madame Saffroni, hair goods of all kinds. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said Madame. Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of you. Down rippled the brown cascade of hair. Twenty dollars, said Madame. Give it to me quick, said Della. The next two hours flew by. Della was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had been to all of them. It was a platinum fob chain, and it was grand. It was worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him, quietness and value. The description applied to both Jim and Della. $21 they took from her, and she hurried home with 87 cents. When Della reached home, she got out her curling irons. Within 40 minutes, her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at a reflection in the mirror long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island schoolgirl. But what could I do? What could I do with a dollar and 87 cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his step on the stair away down on the first flight and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit of saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things. And now she whispered, please God, make him think I am still pretty. The door opened and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow, he was only 22 and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door. His eyes were fixed on Della and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her with that peculiar expression on his face. Jim, darling, don't look at me like that, she said. 
I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair, he said. Cut it off and sold it. Don't you like me just as well anyhow? I'm me without my hair, aren't I? Jim looked about the room. You say your hair is gone? You needn't look for it, she said. It's sold. It's sold and gone. It's Christmas Eve. Be good to me, for it went for you. Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered, but nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim? Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He hugged Della. He took a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it on the table. Don't make any mistake about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going for a while. White fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper and then an ecstatic scream of joy and then a quick change to hysterical tears and wails, prompting the immediate comfort of her husband. For there lay the combs, the set of combs that Della had worshipped long in a store window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in her beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, and her heart had craved and yearned over them without, without the least hope of ever owning them. And now they were hers. But the hair that should have adorned the adornments were gone. Della hugged them tight and looked up at Jim with dim eyes and a smile and said, My hair grows so fast, Jim. Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly in her open palm. The dull, precious metal seemed to flash with the reflection of her bright, ardent spirit. Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, he said, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at the present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now, suppose you put the chops on. <laughs> the Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the magi. Thanks, June. We wanted to share with you the gift of the Magi story. How many of you read that when you were uh, in school? Yeah? It's a short story by Henry O. Henry, and uh, very, very popular. I remember hearing uh, some kids' stories around this very same thing, dr dramatic theaters, and it keeps coming up again and again every year when you read the news or you talk to people about it, and people refer to this story uh, of Della and Jim. It's a perfect reminder of what the real magi, the original magi, the three wise men or the wise men did when they met Jesus. And around Christmas time, uh, we have an opportunity to once again remind ourselves about our priorities, about why we do certain things, why we behave in certain ways. Uh, we have a perspective of Christmas that we need to continue to refine or maybe reshape based upon how we're growing in our faith little guy named Daniel. He was four years old. He went home from his Sunday school class, and uh, he had a new perspective on the Christmas story. So he learned all about the wise men from the East who brought gifts to the baby Jesus. And he was so excited, he had to tell his parents. And he said this, I learned in Sunday school today all about the very first Christmas, 
There wasn't a Santa Claus way back then. So these three guys on camels had to deliver all the toys. And Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, with his nose so bright, wasn't there yet. So they had to have this big light in the sky to find their way around. Little guy's perspective on Christmas got reshaped. He didn't quite get it all right. And yet we're kind of all on that journey ourselves, where we're looking at the Christmas story and we're reshaping it based upon how we see ourselves in light of the scriptures and what the Bible has to say. We start to look at the Christmas time, the Christmas season with different eyes. We get frustrated. Maybe you're getting frustrated with the commercialization around Christmas. And in order to deal with that, maybe you've set some limits or some boundaries around certain things at Christmas. We do that as a family. We set a very specific limit on how much we're going to spend on the kids at Christmas time. As a matter of fact, we've told our kids that we're going to spend more money on you on your birthday than we are on Christmas because we want to remember the real reason for the season. When the kids were little, we had them, when they got a present from grandma or grandpa or from us as parents, and they sat that present on their lap, we told them, you need to pray for that person first before you open it, so that when you're disappointed or you're overexcited, you either forget or you don't want to anymore, but uh, it's good to do it before you open the present. And so our kids did that, and we did that as a family, to remember and reshape and rethink about this whole idea of Christmas. Is it about giving? Or is it about spending? Is it about uh, really the gift of Christmas? Or is it about this commercialization, this Santa Claus and the reindeer thing? And I think that uh, that's the journey that we're kind of on this morning with the story of the Magi, the story of the wise men. Uh, I posted a video on our Facebook page this week. Uh, I hope some of you had a chance to look at it. If you didn't, I really encourage you to do that. It's a behavioral science experiment the behavioral science guys. And uh, what they did was is they had a whole bunch of kids go to meet Santa Claus. And so Santa says to them, so what, are you going, what do you want for Christmas this year? And the kids then go through this litany of things that they want and things that they have been putting on their lists. And it's, of course, all kinds of things, right? And then they take the two kids that are standing in front of Santa and they bring them over to an elf. And the elf has a huge chocolate bear in one hand and an identical chocolate bear, but this big in the other. And he looks at the two kids and he says, well, I only have two left. And he points to one kid and says, okay, you get to choose. Which one do you want? Well, you know what's going to happen next, right? The kid looks at standing there next to the other one. And the one who gets the choice inevitably, almost hundred percent choose the large chocolate bear. And so they, then they change the script for the Santa Claus. Two kids come in and stand in front of Santa Claus. Instead of saying, what do you want for Christmas? He says to them, what are you going to give for Christmas? And immediately the kids are stumped. They don't know what to say. And so Santa has to repeat it and say it in a couple of different ways. And the end result is that these kids are saying, little kids are saying, I'm going to give love for Christmas. I'm going to give hugs for Christmas. I'm going to say thank you to my mommy and daddy at Christmas. And then those two, same, those two kids are now taken over to the same elf and presented with the same option. What would you like? This is the last two you get to choose. And interestingly, the kids, the majority of them, choose the small bear. Isn't it incredible how reshaping the way we talk about and think about Christmas changes the dynamic? It's true in everything in our life. When we understand ourselves in light of who God is, about how much of a gift he has given us, we start to live and talk and be in a way that changes the way other people respond to us, the way we parent, the way we do our jobs, the way we interact with the world around us. It's incredible how that shift can make such a difference. And even our own perceptions of Christmas begin to change. The story, The Gift of the Magi, is a perfect example of that. Della and Jim, they know that they're trying to give the greatest gift that they can. The thing that's most important to Jim is his pocket watch, and most important to Della is her hair. And they both sacrificially give to each other. And it's the most foolish and silly thing that they could have done, and yet probably the wisest. So these wise men... 
they are uh, on this journey. And what I'd like to do this morning is to kind of read through the story of the wise men and the birth of Jesus and stop along the way and have a conversation about what they did and how they went ahead and did it. And so one of the things that uh, we tend to do is we want to, th- well, no, not one. But one of the things I'd like to talk about here this morning is about gift giving. And so a couple of years ago, uh, I had a message where we talked about three kinds of gifts, right? There's the um, gift for a gift gift. Did you catch that? Yeah, the gift for a gift gift. Uh, and then there's the uh, gift for a favor gift. And then there's the grace gift. There are three kinds of gifts that people give. The gift for a gift gift, I'm Sure, I'm going to mess that up eventually. Uh, the gift for a gift gift is when you receive something from a neighbor or a friend or coworker, and you think, oh, well, they gave me something, so I'm going to give them something, right? You run off to Walmart, and you think, well, it's probably cost about 10 bucks, so I'll pay 10 bucks and, and buy a gift and give it to them. So it's a gift for a gift gift. But then there's the gift for a favor gift. And these people, they, they want to, they want, they owe, they want you start over again. These people, uh, they recognize that if they give you this gift, now you owe them something, right? I'm going to give you this wonderful gift. I'll even lavish upon you something wonderful, but you know that you owe me, right? People give amazing, incredible gifts, and then they're disappointed when they don't receive an equal amount. Or maybe you've got a boss or a company that you work for, and they give you a turkey at Christmas or a bonus, but it's really coming as, well, you still owe me a favor now. I want you to be a good employee. I want you to be happy. Yeah, I want you to be grateful. So there's a gift for a favor gift. But then there's the grace gift. The grace gift, the word grace means undeserving favor, right? There's no strings attached to it. I give it to you completely out of the blessings that I have received. I give it to you without expecting in return. I give it to you without any uh, favors owed or attached to it. And that's what Della and Jim did. They gave an incredible gift. And we learn about this gift from the Magi or the wise men. It's the very act of sacrificial giving that they exemplify for us. And all of our sacrifice is just but a faint reflection of what God did with his son Jesus. The Magi knew that. The wise men recognized that. And I hope that you'll recognize that too as we move along. Now, sometimes we get caught up in the sentiment and the images of Christmas, the sentimental images, the story, uh, baby Jesus in the manger, Mary and Joseph kind of hovering around over top of them, camels arriving with the Magi, uh, all surrounded by donkeys, sheep, and angels, right? You know the postcard. Uh, Unfortunately, what our uh, culture has done is we've stacked all of the stories about Jesus and his birth into one little picture. And uh, by doing that, it makes the impression that they all happen simultaneously. And unfortunately, that's not the case. And uh, that's some of the things that happen around Christmas. Sunday school kids kind of get this wrong too. And we've kind of carried on this uh, idea. So there was a bunch of kids who were asked uh, to draw the Christmas story. And of course, uh, some of the scenes included shepherds and angels and the star and the baby Jesus in the manger. And this little fella, he uh, drew something completely different. He drew a picture of a jetliner with four people inside. And uh, the Sunday school teacher says to him, Jimmy, could you explain your little drawing for us a minute? He said, well, it's the flight out of Egypt. And he said, that one's Joseph, this one's Mary, and this one's baby Jesus. And the teacher said, well, who's the guy up front? Oh, she said, that's Pontius the pilot. (laughs) Here again, we, we get this picture of Christmas, and we're trying to reshape it for our kids, trying to make sure that they understand the aspects of the story, but we kind of get them all jumbled up. So here's something that I want you to know. The Magi, the wise men, did not show up on the day that Jesus was born. Okay? So if you're drawing your stories of Christmas with your kids or you're putting out your nativity scene, put the Magi off in the distance because they're still traveling at this point. All right? Uh, They should be on another table on the other side of the room somewhere and with a big light over top of them or something. Uh, They actually don't show up until almost two years after Jesus is born. When he is born, a light appears in the sky. And they see this light from 600 miles away, over in Iraq, Babylon, some area around there. And then they start searching what they know to be true about the astrological signs. They see this light in the sky. They figure out that there's something that happened in Judea, Jerusalem. 
and they begin and they embark on this journey and they show up late to the party, but they show up with gifts, which is great. So you invite them in, right? People who show up late to the party, if they've got gifts, come on in. <laughs> and so they, uh, they show up. And so we're going to read the story here from uh, Matthew chapter, one, chapter two. So Matthew chapter two, you can follow along on the screen here. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship them. So here they are. They come, and they are asking basically for directions. Not only are they late to the party, but they're lost. Uh, the wise men don't know where to go, and so they stop in Jerusalem and decide to knock on the door of King Herod. Now, King Herod was not a Jewish king. He was a Roman king. So this was kind of an occupation, right, in Jerusalem. And Herod, being the king, gets a little nervous because the wise men say, we know that the king of the Jews has been born. And now he gets nervous and a bit upset. And uh, they're saying, you know, he's supposed to be here somewhere. Where do you think he is? And so uh, Pharaoh or Herod uh, brings out the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the scribes, and they start searching through the scriptures, and they come up with an answer for him. And it starts like this. Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. And he called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Ju Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Now you'd think that if the news that the king of the Jews is announced by these wise men who've come from the east, that the people of Israel would have been rejoicing. But they don't. They're disturbed, says the Bible. And Herod is more than disturbed. I think that that's still true today. A lot of people don't want to hear the message, the real message of Christmas. That God gave his one and only son. And he came into this world and lived among us. Lived as one of us. So that he could identify with each and one of us. And our trials. I don't think the world still wants to hear that message. They keep pushing it off to the side. And trying to ignore the word Christmas. Christ. In the word. And I think that they are just as disturbed today as they were back then. Nobody ran out and said, let's make a banner. There was no ticker tape parade. There was no people running the 10 kilometers to Bethlehem to go see what was going on. And so the wise men have to go off on their own. Now, here's the problem. Verse 7. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. The problem here is that Herod is not disturbed. Herod is full of hate. He's not a nice man to begin with. By the way, he killed most of his family off because he was paranoid about them taking over. He had 10 wives. Uh, he had all kinds of illegitimate children who were fighting to take over his reign. And he eventually died of some very terrible, terrible disease. It was almost like the evil inside him was seeping out. He was not a nice man. And he comes up with this plot. And he says, hey, when you find him, come back and let me know where he is. Because what happens a little later on in verse 16 is this. The wise men find baby Jesus. And they go to him and they worship him. And they receive in a dream a vision. Don't go back to Herod. And so in verse 16, I'm just going to skip ahead, Mike. So we're going to come back to where we are right now. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. And he sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based upon the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. That's how awful this man was. It's a little town, but make no mistake, probably 20 to 30 infants, children, are murdered because of Herod's paranoia. Nobody wanted to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Nobody was interested. They were disturbed by all of this, and yet the wise men continue on their journey. In verse 9, After the, this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. 
It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. Now, just a little caveat here. The reason why we say Jesus was probably a child at this time is because the Bible says a child. The word is really, literally, the word for a toddler. There's a different word for an infant, and so the Bible uses this word, toddler. And they go to their house. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy, and they entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. It's, there's a sense in which they've moved into some living quarters, set up a life there in Bethlehem, and the wise men show up later on. But here's the amazing thing. That these men, who were not Jewish, who were probably just investigating the astro, astro, astrological event that happened, and trying to connect it with their philosophy and the religions of the day, have come to the conclusion that the king of the Jews is born. And they show up at his door and get down on bended knee and worship this little baby. It's incredible when you think about it. They show up traveling 600 miles in person. They could have sent a letter. They could have sent an envoy. But these were uh, learned men who traveled a great distance to worship this king. And I think that it disturbed a lot of the people because of the actions of the Magi. I think that they were disturbed more because other people were starting to look for this Messiah. And I think what happens is, is that when we start talking about Jesus, born in a manger with our friends, and we don't talk about Christmas, people still get uncomfortable. They still get that uh, awkward feeling. And maybe even we do too, because if it's true, if it really is true, that the Magi traveled and that baby really exists, and if it's true for them and it's true for us, then it requires a response. It requires a response from us as God's people. We might have to change our lives. We might, not have, to, we might have to make different decisions about stuff in our life. We might not be able to live the way we've always lived. Because Jesus, if he really did come, and he really is God, is going to require a response from us. All right. So they bowed down and they worshiped Jesus. They showed up at the house. I think it says a lot about them and uh, who they were as people. But what about these gifts that they were given, that they give? Verse 11, they entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. And then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts fit for a king. In the old Persian days, if you were going to meet a king or if you were going to be introduced to him, you gave him a gift of gold. And it's a signification of something important that they recognized this wasn't just any old thing, but it was something important. And what we learn from uh, the Bible a little later on, because Herod is trying to kill them, Mary and Joseph actually do try to flee to Egypt. They don't take a flight to Egypt, but they take a camel probably or a donkey. And they uh, all go off. But this gold probably helped them to do that. The Magi, they give uh, uh, incense or frankincense. And it was used in the temple for worship. And they also give myrrh, which is a very strange thing to give to a child. It's like giving embalming fluid to a child. Could you imagine? Oh, here's a wonderful gift for you. Your embalming fluid for the day that you die. Uh, that's what myrrh was used for. Myrrh was a, a, an incense, a spice that was used for the embalming of a body. And somehow these magi knew that this child would die. And that he would be honored by the gift. It's incredible to me over and over again how the Old Testament has given us examples and predictions of what would happen in this day when Jesus was born. Given us predictions about how he would die and the manner in which he died. The day he was, or the, the place that he was going to be born, that he was going to be born of a virgin. There are eight significant prophecies in the Old Testament that predict this, that were 800 to 1,000 years before Jesus even came on the scene. And they all came true. Those of you who are math geeks out of there, I've said this before to you, but the statistical probability of that happening is one to the power of 17, uh, one to the power of one with 17 zeros in it. 
That would be like taking the entire province of Saskatchewan, filling it two feet deep with loonies, and then throwing one toonie in the mix, blindfolding someone, dropping him out of a helicopter, and asking him to pick up one coin, and that's the toonie. That's the same statistical probability that all eight of those prophecies get fulfilled. It's incredible to me that these magi would understand and come from the east, that the Bible would predict these things, that Jesus really is who he says he is. And they bring these incredible gifts to Jesus, this little child in Bethlehem. How about you? What gifts are you going to bring to your family, to your friends this Christmas? The wise men traveled from far away. They brought valuable gifts. They gave generously. They gave sacrificially. What are you going to give this Christmas? I'm asking you this because I'm asking you to think in relation to the fact that Jesus really is and really did show up on this planet. Your life is a response to the gift that God has given. Are you going to give more of your heart to the Lord? Maybe some of you have never done that before and you're uh, entering on this journey where you're recognizing that God is an important part of your life. You want to give yourself to him the ultimate gift of your heart. How about your will? Is there some place in your life where you need to turn over to God and say, okay, God, I'm going to do as you ask me to. I'm going to provide. I'm going to be. I'm going to change. I'm going to shape this for you because I know this is what you ask of me. How about your stuff? If you think about giving any of your stuff away, God has blessed us generously. God has blessed us financially. How about giving away some of your stuff to him? What gift are you going to bring? And how are you going to live in response to the fact that God gave his most precious gift, his son, Jesus Christ, not only to live on earth, but to die on the cross for our salvation, for the good of all humanity, and that he lived as one of us. What are you going to give this Christmas? Let me pray for you. Lord, I want to thank you for uh, the gift of your son, Jesus. I want to ask you to bless our relationship with him so that we might get to know this baby Jesus even better, that we might know him not as a baby, but as a, a man who lived and died a criminal's death on the cross for our salvation. Lord, I pray that you would honor the gift that we bring this Christmas, the gift like the Magi. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're going to sing one more song together, and uh, I'm going to uh, give you a blessing, and we're going to go out from here today. I'm going to stand. There are prayer teams available in the front if you want someone to pray for you uh, after the service this morning. We encourage you to do that. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. And may the gracious gift of his son, Jesus Christ, be a blessing to you. And may the power of the Spirit fill you with that generosity. Amen.